Hey, George for Tidal, Inflation.us. We're here in Southern California. We're going to cover a story about living free. Most people have your insurance bills that you got to pay, your medical insurance bills, your car registration bills. I mean, the amount of bills that people get can crush a family. We're going to talk about a whole new way to live, not just free of bills, not just free of um, extra expenses and taxes and all these other regulations and burdens that the government puts upon you. I'm talking about an entire change of lifestyle. This is the beginnings of an off the grid, off the urban grid series, living free. It's kind of based upon the free man on the land. And we're going to find out more. We have two gentlemen here that have agreed for us to kind of profile what they have done over the last, what, 10, 20, 30 years in their quest to live free. Out of high school, I, I was lucky enough to get a, a union job, Teamsters, working for UPS. Um, about five years later, I got married and obviously I couldn't, it was a part-time job even though it paid well. So I ended up getting two uh, union jobs and I worked for, it's actually the largest uh, private employer in San Bernardino for a major supermarket chain. And I, I worked two jobs for uh, five years um, trying to make ends meet. Um, and then we uh, moved and decided to buy a house and I actually got to go full time at the, uh, at the store. So I did that for another 21 years. Um, and when we moved in the house, uh, I was lucky enough to uh, be able to meet all the bills on my, I was working six days a week, but I, my wife was able to stay home and take care of the children. And um, we were living the American dream. It was like, you know, we had this beautiful home uh, I have two beautiful kids and it was great, but within a few years um, we weren't able to make it. One of the things that when I was working uh, graveyard at the store, um, I was listening to all these AM radio stations, you know, like Coast to Coast and similar shows. And one thing you, you started to figure out was the basic problem in our country and probably around the world is our money system. We have, it seemed to have one group of people who can create money and the other people that have to work for their money. And, and um, I don't know, I guess I overreacted, but I got really mad. So, so, so I, sold, I, sold, I sold that house. Um, uh, obviously, my wife didn't like it at all um, and uh, decided to try to get as simple as a life I could I got rid of all my credit cards, uh, tried to uh, get rid of, uh, you know, any kind of government, I consider them contracts like social security and driver's licenses, and just try to see if I could, uh, in my mind, live free or at least have the government do what it said is, is, it's supposed to. If you look, read the, the, the Constitution for the United States and for the Constitution for the state of California, the purpose of government originally was to protect our inalienable rights. And, and it seems to me they're supposed to be working for us and if you look around, it seems to we, me we're working for them. So I had a problem with that. So I decided I actually went back to school and, and studied law because I, I found that law is what they're using to entrap all of us. Um, law was designed to protect our rights, but like when you go to court, court and law is, is by definition the use of force. It, it authorizes the use of force. So in other words, if you get a, it authorizes them to pull you over. It authorizes them to take your wages to pay a tax. It, it, they can, uh, you know, evict you out of your home. It's all, that's what the court system now is. They're rationalizing their system and forcing the people to do something. And, it, and it's supposed to be, you're supposed to have uh, due process. But when you find out how the courts are running now and the way they should be running, you find out it's all a show. It's, it's just a big circus show. It, there's, there's, you know, I, I've, I've 
actually filed a motion when you understand these courts are not constitutional courts. There are, are at one time there was all these courts in California, and in 1998 they merged them. So when you go rock into a court, you may be in this jurisdiction or this ju jurisdiction or this jurisdiction, and if you don't know, you don't know where you're at. I refuse to accept that I'm one of their subjects. I, I'm a people, and you're supposed to be working there. Now I don't want to do anything immoral. I just want them to protect my rights. And so when you go in there with that attitude, you can have some effect, but they they will kick and, you know, it's, it, this whole system under the 13th Amendment is considered voluntary. But as soon as you decide not to volunteer, then they have a problem with that. <laughs> this government's just getting out of control. They, they think the Constitution's a joke. Yeah, I've had plenty of confrontations with the police. In one uh, situation, a uh, cop even pulled his billy club out and told me, that's the Constitution. So when you, you've got men who are supposed to be law enforcement who act with this ruthless mug mentality and they're supposed to be protecting us, we've got a serious problem in this country. I know there's some good policemen out there, but I'll say it right here in front of the world, there's not very many. The other problem we have in this country with the police is they know absolutely nothing about the law. And that's their job. You know, they put a tin badge on these guys' chest, send them out there with a revolver and a billy club, and now all of a sudden they're experts in the law. So, I'm sorry, it don't work that way. You know, that's the way the gang members do it. Now, if you want to be associated with gang members, which that's what's happening, then that's what you're going to get. You're going to lose all your respect. The men with the uniform, need to protect the Constitution. And uh, it wasn't too long ago I heard a testimony by uh, Sheriff Mack from Arizona. Now there's a man who got convicted one day and realized, hey, I'm not protecting the people. I'm destroying them. I'm just running around with my billy club collecting revenue for some bankrupt uh, corporation, which they call a police department or sheriff department. And that's what it's all about, just collecting money and beating down on innocent women and <laughs> Families that can't even afford gas for their cars, that's not the policeman's job. Uh, I think my wake up call was who is the IRS <laughs> and how come they're taking all this money from me and they're giving me absolutely nothing except a hard time? So I started researching into that and then that it just expanded and exploded from there. Most government agencies today are just basically parasites, they produce nothing, they just suck the lifeblood out of the people. Now the reason this is all taking place, for the most part, I believe, is we live in a debt society, debt-based society. The money's all backwards. Technically, there is no money. If you don't have a silver coin in your pocket, or a gold coin in your pocket, you're a vagrant. You have nothing. So this is all connected, I think, with a social security number. And I realize, you know what? That's not quite the mark of the beast yet, but it's almost there. It's a precursor. That number, people worship that number. There's two things in this country people worship. They don't worship a man in his handshake. They worship a piece of plastic with his picture on it. And they worship that number. It's like, I got a cell phone, but you can't believe the trouble it went to to get it without this, this evil number. It's just amazing to me. You can go, you can try and send some money to somebody from a local drugstore on the other side of the world. Oh, if you don't have that piece of plastic, we can't ship that money. It's like it's incredible. I said, what's wrong with me? I'm standing here in front of you. You want to just put a picture frame around my face? Let's pretend I'm the ID card. Hey, this is George for TitleInflation.us. We're here with Kurt and Tim discussing free men on the land living um, undisclosed location, Southern California. And um, maybe you guys should just do a real quick intro, your background and what, what caused you to live this type of lifestyle. Kurt, you want to go first? Okay. You know, my birth certificate is is my name and my Bible. You know, I don't have some special paper that the government's borrowing millions of dollars on my birth certificate somewhere. If they're doing it, they don't have my consent anymore. I think that w that's the big string they got is everybody's in debt. And we've, we've come to expect a certain uh, standard of living. And my opinion is we're slowly being ratcheted down to they're trying to make the United States a level playing field with other countries in the world. In other words, they're raising their standard of living by lowering ours. 
You need to just start going over all your billing. You know, you got to learn how to cut. And if you have to, you might have to move out of that four hundred thousand dollar house. There's plenty of them out there now for hundred thousand. Plenty of them for fifty thousand. Just take steps like that. But yeah, get out of debt first of all. So it's the number one way to become a free man is you can't be free if you have debt. Exactly. Yeah. So cut up the credit cards, work on getting rid of the mortgage, and then uh, try to get into a situation where you have very small amount of expenses. Yeah, because that way, I mean, now, you know, especially anybody that's working, you, you're, you never know from day to day, either they're going to cut your hours, or you're going to lose your job. So I see people right now that, uh, you know, that I'm dealing with, they, they have a mortgage, they got two car payments, and uh, I just talked to a guy last week, he just lost his job. Um, so they're they're having they're gonna have to walk away from the house and walk away from their vehicles. I really they, they really don't know what they're gonna do. And they were actually, you know, in everybody's mind, they were living the American dream. But you know, once he lost his job, he, you know, he might get unemployment, but for a while, it, but it's it's not gonna be anything compared to what he was making. Okay, if anybody has Social Security, every year or two they'll send you a thing and they'll say, okay, you have this amount of entitlement for your benefits and, it, and you have an account with this much money in it. There's no money there. It, it, the Social Security system is actually thrown into the general fund. So they could pull the, the rug out from under Social Security at any minute. And you know they keep talking about it going bankrupt any time. So um, I think that's the big trick is they want to get you on some kind of depending on their system because they keep extending the unemployment benefits and you know under it sounds reasonable but you know how how can you keep dishing out something and no money be coming in if there's so um, I think at some point relying on all these benefits is going to be to our detriment because it's, like I said, it's going to be like a Katrina situation where we're counting on big government to save us and they're not going to be there. We want to have peace in our life. In other words, we don't want to be always scared or worried. And we don't, and we want to do as we want to as long as we don't injure somebody else. And it seems to it now that we, everything, that if we want to do something, including work or have property, it's all regulated. And if you, if you go to Biblical Law, one basic law in there is, oh, no man, no debt. Well, sorry, folks, in this country, owing debt, that's the name of the game. The government's the biggest debtor that ever existed on the face of the earth. Um, well, if you go back and you, you study the history, uh, you know, I mean, first they created the Federal Reserve, which was the violation of the Constitution in the first place, um, because Congress can't delegate to a private anybody something that's their responsibility. That's number one. It took them 20 years to bankrupt the country. If you look at in 1913 when the Federal Reserve was created, the United States was the wealthiest and the largest creditor nation in the earth. 2013 will be 100 years. I, I think we're the biggest debtor nation. Anyway, it took them 20 years. And basically, if you read the Constitution, this has never been amended. All money must be gold and silver. You can't print it. It's a commodity. <laughs> Somebody had to go out and mine it make it, melt it down, and so it was equal, it was fair. And, and if, you, if you understand what just, justice is, and you know, he was saying, what does it mean to be a free man? I'm saying it's being a moral and responsible man. Because if you understand what justice is, if you, re you read up the definition, and then, you, know, you go to court, you're, you're expecting justice. It means rectitude, which means a moral character. Which is fair for you is fair for me. Now we have a, a private corporation called the Federal Reserve that can print money at will. When you go to the bank, you sign something called a promissory note. The bank actually accepts that as a deposit from you. In other words, you're depositing your future pay. That's put it, and the banking system is a double book entry system. They never show you the asset side of the books. That is your promissory note. They deposit that and write a check off that promissory note. It, they create it, and if you read all the, the Federal Reserve publications, they admit they create money out of thin air. So, to me, that's not a just system. People are realizing, okay, the, it's a win-win situation for the bank, and it's a lose-lose-lose for the people. So what we're talking about now is the Social Security number, because that's where it all comes from. 
Tell me what that means to you, Social Security. Well, for me to be a free man, I realized soon after I started studying all this, I had to get rid of that number. So, because that number makes you a slave. It connects you to all this unlawful debt that the government creates. So, to get rid of that number, yeah, you've got problems in your life, but you also have a lot of freedom, too. And just to, re to sleep at night and know, you know, well, I'm not a part of those 15 or $20 trillion debt numbers they keep throwing across the TV screen. It gives me a peace of mind. I'm not a part of it. I don't owe anybody any debt. Okay, and that's the way I want to keep it. Now, everybody has a Social Security number. You have to get a Social Security number. No, you don't. Why? Show me a law that says you have to have it. Well, it, if... If you read the, um, the 13th Amendment, see, they had a, like a, uh, government believes if they do something, they give you a remedy, it's okay. They created the 13th Amendment, which, which prohibited slavery or involuntary servitude. Well, what's the presumption there? You can volunteer. So then they created the 14th Amendment, created a U.S. citizen, which most people don't understand prior to that amendment, there was no such thing as the United States citizen legally defined. Uh, California Supreme Court, in the case before that, just said before that that a U.S. citizen was um, a general name given to um, state citizens. In other words, if, if you understand, if you live in California and you're one of the people, you should actually be called Californian. So a U.S. citizen is, is basically a subject of Congress. Yeah, there's a form to, to get rid of your Social Security number, but... Um, now, the Social Security Administration will kick and scream um, when you fill that form out. Here, here's a, a second... And they'll play stupid, kick and scream, everything, because they don't want you to fill that form out. Why? Because by co being connected to the, each man with that number, they can create all this debt. As soon as you say, you know what, I don't want to be a part of your debt anymore... They just lost a kind of count. And you said Social Security numbers didn't exist before 1933. No, it was created in an act right after 1933. So before 1933, what did people do? Before that, people actually were responsible. They would have to go out to work and save for their retirement. And of course, back then, money was gold and silver coin. So that, you know, you, you see all these old movies and people had their money in their mattress. They didn't put it in the banks because people understood they didn't trust banks and their money was gold and silver coin so uh, before that but the Great Depression created a situation where people it's much like today people were on the street starving they were in bread lines um, if you go on YouTube and you watch some of the videos back then there were riots in the streets and you know people just don't realize how rough it was I, I you know I'm at an age where I actually knew some people that survived the Great Depression and they literally lived much like the way I am now. I mean, they, obviously they went out and got their social security number, but they, they put away every dime they could because they were always afraid that would, it would happen again. So the government, this, it started with the Federal Reserve, but it started with social security number. What's the significance? Why did they want to get the social security number? It's a tracking number. Every, everything you do is tied to that number and they can tell, you know, now. <laughs> well, what's wrong with that? Well, I mean devil's advocate. It, it, What's it, wrong with that? It, if you read the, the preamble of the California Constitution, it says one of the, the unalienable rights is privacy. And, and why, did, why did our founding fathers so much want privacy? That's why you, they have to have warrants to get invade your privacy and look at your papers. Was because they, they always knew that, that big government, because they just came from England where there was an abusive king. And if you read the, the Declaration of Independence, it was basically an indictment against the king for all his tyranny and just basically he could stop you on the street and pick your pockets. So we, we, the Founding Fathers knew that if the people were going to have the freedom, they had to be private. And the Social Security makes you public. You, you cannot do anything because, it, and you ask me, is that number public? Yeah, do you have to have it for a job? Do you have to have it for a bank account? Do you have to have it for a driver's license? They're all now required. And if you read the original uh, Social Security Act, 
they said it was an insurance policy and that that number would never be used for an identification. And now, now, it, now look where it's at. Now it's required. And, and, and like I got this section, you look at the California Vehicle Code 1653, it requires for you to have a driver's license that you submit your social security number. So you cannot do anything now without that number. Okay, and what are the negative aspects of having a social security number? It seems like you're building up, well, a lot of people don't believe in social security anymore, that there's not gonna be any money in social security, but what are the negative aspects of having a social security number? Well, when you become, when you accept the social security number, the presumption is now, they had to make a, a artificial system because if you understand gold and silver is, uh, is something you can touch. It's, you know, now we have paper dollars. And, you know, it says Federal Reserve Note. And it, it used to say uh, redeemable to bearer for $1 in silver coin. Now it just says it's a promise to pay. If you read what a note is, it's a promise to pay. What are they promised to pay? Another promise to pay. It's just paper. So it's an artificial system. So what they did is they had to create an artificial system for you to live in. Um, so like like income, do, most people don't understand. If you read the Social Security Act, that's also created the income tax. Um, so everything came from the Federal Reserve and the Social Security right. number. And everything then, that birthed all of these negative aspects of the big government bureaucracy. The big bureaucracy back in 33, they were going to leave this country in the depression and leave people starving to death if they didn't get them on their knees to accept that number. That's how important this was to the like IMF, the big banks of the world. We'll put those Americans on their knees and they'll beg for that number. And then we'll tax them and their children and their great grandchildren. We'll just keep going with it. Now we're just getting into phase two. We've just come out of phase one. Now they want to tax us until the whole world dies. And they made the debt so huge, there's no way anybody can pay it, but it's all counterfeit. And what keeps that counterfeit going? The bankers, the guy out there on the street who thinks he's a, a law enforcement officer with a tin badge on his chest, they're the ones keeping this phony counterfeit thing going. If those people would learn the law and back off, this thing would collapse and go back to reality. Well, and the, the other thing is with the social security system, what people... I mean, it's in the name. It's a socialist system. The presumption is, is, is the people that gave up all their property in something called the New Deal, which was, is basically Social Security, in exchange for benefits and privilege for, from government and basically your retirement. So, so when you accept a Social Security number, you're giving up your free rights. Unalienable rights. And if you know what that word means, it means unalienable. It means you can't put a price on them. They're, they're, they're so valuable, money can't buy them. So, so when I get a social security number, you're saying I become a slave. Yes. Yeah. I become yes. a government employee is what you said. Well, I, I was going to, like, here's a couple of these. This is like a Supreme Court case. Income has been taken to mean the same thing as used in the corporate excise tax of 1909 in the 16th Amendment and the various revenue acts. In other words, the income tax, if you understand it and you read, I, I actually got a copy of the corporate excise tax of 1909. That is the act that created the income tax. And so what it is, you know, everybody goes, how did we go from having inalienable rights to privileges? Like, you know, you, when now you have a driving privilege. You have a privilege to go work now, and your privilege is up on you getting that number. So, you know, when you, we'll get into, our, you know, how we had problems getting pulled over trying to travel without a driver's license. But now, you know, any officer will say that's a privilege. So. Let me get this straight. What you're saying is you take away your Social Security number, then you're, you're opting out of the system, and all of a sudden, nothing makes sense anymore. Or it makes perfect sense in your world. Well, you stop. I mean, that's kind of like the foundation uh, brick underneath the government control over a person is the Social Security number. Once you take that out, then you're saying... Then I, I'm personally, I'm going to claim my inalienable rights. I, I, I'd rather give up those benefits and, and take that, your God-given rights. And when, let's, you, when you cut the cord, you know, basically it's an umbilical cord, social security number, or 
if you want to go to the next stage of getting off your mother's breast, grow up. Be responsible for yourself. You work. You save for your future. You build for your family. So your family can inherit something, not some parasite government. If you get rid of your Social Security number, yeah, you're getting off the breast. And all of us out there that have one or had one, I'm sorry, you're on the breast. Wake up, people. <laughs> so, but once you get off the breast, you take away Social Security. There's some benefits now that you're in, you have inalienable rights. You're under a whole different system. What system are you? And then what are the tangible benefits now when you take yourself out of the equation? Like you're in that now way? in a lawful system. When you live in a debt-based system, you are unlawful. I don't care how many flags you wrap around yourself or fly in your front yard. If you're under a Social Security number, you're in a debt system, and you're promoting it by pulling away from it. Now you begin down the tough road of freedom. And yes, freedom is not free. It's, a, it's always been a battle. But I feel now just getting out of this number system and paper system that they've engulfed us with, it's going to be one of the biggest battles that Americans have ever faced. Go ahead. Yeah, basically, if you understand the original concept of this country, there was supposed to be no direct taxes. So, so your property, like your car, your house, your work, um, those were not to be taxes. You could, there would always be indirect taxes. Uh, indirect tax would be a sales tax, would be like the gasoline taxes. Those are, are legitimate taxes, but you could always avoid them. It, if you chose to um, buy less gasoline, you, you're, you would reduce your taxes. Um, so, but by having that social security number and, and dedicating your property to the state, which is registering now with the county recorder, it, it actually what it is is it's a means of government control over your life because let's say we're in a situation like we are now, everybody's losing their jobs. Okay, let's say you even have your house paid off. How are you gonna pay your property taxes? You know, so, so now the government, I, I like to call it like in the old days, it would be the king can now come in, you're not paying your, your tribute to the king, so now he has the right to throw the serfs off the, the property. So now you're, you're basically homeless again. And so I don't consider me a lawbreaker at all, although the government at, at this point does consider me a lawbreaker. And, and it's basically because, you know, as long as I'm not injuring somebody else, I feel that I should be able to exercise my unalienable rights. And let me add this, because there's so many people out there who feel like, oh, how's the government going to survive? How are they going to help all these other people? And it's, I mean, it's to the point now, me personally, it's a joke, but some people, it's a very serious issue, and they want to beat you up when you say, oh, I don't think I owe this tax or that tax. But they act like, how are they going to survive? Well, let me just give you a, a, a little insight. You've got to do your research, though, to, to check this out. But if, if a government nowadays collects $10, their community's lucky if they get a dollar of that back. Because our evil governments have two sets of books, if not three. Social Security, driver's license. Let's talk about the national debt. We talk about that in the documentaries I've done. Our national debt out of control. It's past 12 trillion. We've gone from the largest creditor nation to the largest debtor nation. Who owns all this debt? They always talk about we're giving this debt to our children. Our poor children. Yeah. Now how the heck did my children own this debt which they've used to, you know, uh, <laughs> they've used it to spend money in wars on Afghanistan and Iraq. I mean, why do my children owe this debt? Because they deceived you as a dad to let them have that social security number. Well, and, and what people got to realize, okay, if you remember the Constitution, money is gold or silver coin. And the reason is you can't counterfeit it. You can't just print it. So the way I like to put people picturing how this all works is um, the government prints the money. And uh, I don't know if you remember a few years ago with Ross Perot, they were saying we're going to balance the budget. If you understand the system, if you balance the system, it'll collapse. Because we're a debt-based monetary yes. system. Now, this is Our where, money is debt. Exactly. Itself is it's debt. It's a lien. Yes. It's a lien against your property. So 
Um, which is unconstitutional. Yes, because they didn't give you any consideration for it. So if, if the w best way I could put this is, let's say we wanted to pay off the debt and, and, and be debt free. So let's say a dollar bill represents all the money in circulation from the United States. And there was 1% interest on it because it's a debt-based society. In other words, we give, it, we give all our property to the, to the Federal Reserve in the form of a bond. And they print the money, but they always charge interest. So let's say we want to pay off the Federal Reserve all that debt that we gave our children. And let's say it's a, it, a $1 bill would represent it. Okay, so we pull our money, and now there's no more money in circulation because we're going to pay off the debt. Okay, let's say the debt, all the money in circulation is, a, is that $1 bill, but they charge 1% interest. Where do you get the money to pay the interest? You have to borrow it. You can never pay it off. It's a Potsy scheme. Well, it's mathematically impossible to pay it off. That's what people need to get from that, this. And that is slavery by definition. Well, and the problem, the problem is, like I said before, is the interest. If government printed it interest-free, then a dollar would stay a dollar. There would never be inflation. The inflation is totally to the bankers. That's how come if you stop using this and you say, okay, I want to use silver or I want to barter, you're breaking the law. No. Or you're, you're breaking, breaking their law. You're breaking their well, code. Yeah. Your code. Let's say if we wanted to pay our electric bill in gold and silver coin, they would probably only give you face value for it. Yeah. So, so let's say, you know, a, a, a $1 uh, silver coin now is probably worth around 17 to $20. So um, you can't, and then there's certain places that, won't, you're right, will only accept Federal Reserve notes. Um, I know, like, you know, like, if you try to pay your property taxes. Everywhere only accepts Federal yeah. Reserve. Yeah, and the, re the reason is, is because they're, they're all tied into that system. The debt-based monetary credit system. Right. And that, and that, and the corporations make, I mean, Lincoln even said it. He, he said he was concerned about this country, country because the banks and the corporations would use the prejudice of the people to, in other words, he's, they, they used our prejudice to, to fractionalize us, and we're, in other words, we're blaming each other. We're blaming the illegal aliens, we're gay marriage, whatever it is, we're blaming each other. But Obama, we're not looking, yeah. Bush, we, Republicans, Democrats, exactly. when they wouldn't even have the money to do this damage if it wasn't for the Federal Reserve. Exactly. Right. So, we, so That's why we can wage war. That's why we can, uh, too much government entitlement spending. It's because they have unlimited amounts of money. And they can just print it, and they can force you to pay it. Our children owe that money. Now, if you back up a little bit, I mean, even when I was a child, you could still find a dollar that said silver certificate on it. Now, theoretically, that dollar had a silver backing it up somewhere. You know, we were all told there were stacks of gold in Fort Knox. Now all that's in there is a, is a mouse with a piece of cheese. But <laughs> at, at one point, there was actually some bullion, silver and gold bullion, backing up the currency. Now there's nothing backing up. And what a lot of people don't even understand is even the paper money that's out there is a fraction of the e-money that's floating around the, the globe. The common person, if you say the Federal Reserve, you say get don't have a Social Security number, don't have a driver's, they'll think crazy, crazy, crazy. Sure. But if you say your children don't owe $100,000 to the national debt, they'll say, now that makes sense. Talk about that. I a tax is supposed to do the necessity of government, in other words, protecting our rights. Now, when they take more than what is a legal tax and take money from you and give it to this guy, that's not a tax. That's stealing under guise of a tax. That's a redistribution of wealth. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And you'll always find out, whether it's like this Car for Junker program or all these things, these stimulus projects, look at what they do. Who benefits? It's always the corporate world giving trillions of dollars to Wall Street banks, giving money to General Motors, yeah. all these stimuluses, all these bailouts, right. this money's coming from you. Right, and it, it always benefits the corporations and banks. It never benefits the people because yes, the person got a new car, right? Let's say he had his old clunker car, he's going, wow, I got so many thousands of dollars from the government, but he was compelled 
to buy a new car, and chances are he had to go and get a loan for the remainder of the amount. Get into more debt. Got more debt. Yes. So, so it's a win-win for the government. Okay, so let's just wrap this up again. The so you're saying the children don't owe national debt. It's just that. all those are digits in a computer. They just they just punch them in there, just like the, the stimulus package. Where did that money come from? They created trillions of dollars and they just punched it into a computer. Now they 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 so what's the answer? It's ultimately we need to go back to a just money system. And what's the odds of doing that? Because if you look throughout history, every time we get close to this point, just like the Great Depression, because if you right before nineteen thirteen if you look at the period between 1890 and about 1910, people were getting away from the banks. They were doing so well, they were virtually paying cash for everything. And the bankers were in a panic. And they had to come up with something to get us back in debt. And now the bankers are in a panic again because the economy's crashing and... Well, they created this panic. Okay. Just like the Great Depression, like I said, Bernanke in a speech admitted and you can, I, I, it's still on the, the Federal Reserve's website. He, they list all his speeches. He admitted that the Federal Reserve created the, the 1929 crash and the Great Depression, and he apologized for it. But is, has the Federal Reserve ever been audited or account, made accountable? No. No. And, and they're doing it once again. As soon as, as, as something happens, it, it goes back to the old system they used in Germany. They, they create a crisis with, with a foregone conclusion, in other words, their agenda. So out of this recession that we're going to go through now, you'll see a stricter, more regulation, more taxes. More government control. More government. Yeah. And that's their, that's their intent and purpose. It's control. It, it's not only the money, but in order to maintain the money system, they have to have more control. So and, it's and, both. And beware, people, because... If they can't keep this Ponzi scheme going, they will create some kind of disaster. And who's they? You figure that out for yourself. <laughs> well, the next thing we're going to talk about is driver's license. Everybody thinks you need a driver's license. Everyone has a driver's license. Um, but there's Almost a whole bunch of, <laughs> There's a whole bunch of negative connotations of that. I mean, you have to go get it retested and owning cars you got to pay register in California the registration fees are ridiculous and they keep going up and they keep going up and that's like I never understood that a registration fee you should pay once that's a tax it's an ongoing yearly tax talk about how a driver's license is in a free man's vocabulary or lifestyle um, well first I think people should go back to the, the beginning I got here that this is the original uh, California statute um, that created the DMV. Um, so anyway, it defines the original uh, intent and purpose, and it's never been changed. There's been a, these these definitions um, are this. They've been kind of hidden, but they've never been changed. So I'll I'll just I'll read the the first sentence of the, the act, an act to impose a license fee for the transportation of persons or property for hire or compensation. So the first presumption is you're, you're, you're on the roadway for hire or compensation. In other words, you're a business for profit. And then you get down here and it defines the word operator. Um, and the word operator shall include all persons, firms, associations, and corporations who operate motor vehicles upon the public highways in this state and thereby engage in the transportation of persons or property for higher compensation. So what you're saying is millions and millions of Californians don't technically legally need to have a driver's license. And, and right. that, and that's the, and that, that, even if they have a social security card, you're saying legally right. they don't need a license. Unless they're hauling their family around for a business. Most people are just hauling their children somewhere. Yeah. Is that a business? Are you going to the grocery store? Is that a business? No. Are you making a profit? No. So the founding fathers wanted us to be able to travel freely without a cost well, or a regulation. That is a basic, if you want to see a free society, the right to travel is about as basic as you can get. That's almost like breathing air. And let me throw this out there. This will really shock some people. 
a license is an evil, that's a bad word. A license gives a fiction permission to operate in reality. So by claiming a license, you're saying, I'm a corporate fiction. I don't want to be a real man or a real woman. If that's what you want to be, fine. But I don't want to be a fake. I want to be real. And I don't need permission from some bankrupt corporation to tell me if, whether I can go from point A to point B. That was given to me from my creator. And my creator ain't some state legislature. Okay? So when a police officer pulls you over, you don't have a license. How do you deal with that? Well, that happened to me just recently. And um, the reason I got pulled over was because my windows were tinted. It, it, was, a, it was not my car, but I, I was behind the wheel. And I was not driving. Um, if you read, look up the definition of driver, it means a person hired to, to take cargo or people for, in other words, you're, you're, you're passengers, a, not people. Yeah, you're, you're taking people for, for a fare. You're like a chauffeur. Like a taxi cab driver. Exactly. Yeah. So you're a passenger even though you're driving the car. Well, I'm traveling. I'm not a driver. So anyway, but in common speak, people think, "Oh, you are you are the well, driver of the car." That's the, that's the thing. But yeah. in legal speak, you're not the driver. Yeah, that's the thing. People, we, yes. We've we've adopted many common words that have legal meanings, and we don't know what the legal meaning is. Yeah, so driver, we, driver is a commercial so, word. Yeah, driver means you're employed to make money. You're making a living out. What's that called when you What's that called when you drive a car? That's you're, moving you're, about the uh, common way. You're traveling. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, anyway, I got operator pulled. operating a car. Operator no. operator is somebody that owns the business. Operator <laughs> is a commercial term. Yeah, yeah. so You're that's behind the wheel. You there you wanna, go. You want to get out of commerce if you want to be free. <laughs> now, if you don't want to be free, just stay in. Sign up for all of it. <laughs> but that, but like I, when I talk to people, I'll say I'm a driver, but I'm not talking legally. So when a when an officer pulls me over like that particular time for my tinted windows, he pulled me over. Uh, I handed him an ID that was not from the state or United States. What does it look like? It's just got a picture. It's actually from an Indian, but it's actually, it, it is valid because this particular Indian tribe that gave me the ID does have a treaty signed by the President of the United States back in the 1700s. But it is a piece of plastic, and it does have a photograph on it, and because so-called law enforcement worship plastic cards, it works. Before that, you guys wouldn't even use cards. No, no. When you got pulled over, you would just say, um, be "Because your average officer out there, he's not trained in the law. He has no concept about being a free man of the Constitution versus being in, in commerce. They, they, all they think is, you go out there. Everybody's basically what they're teaching them, but they don't even know it. Is everyone's in commerce, and you make sure they stay in commerce. I don't want to be in commerce." Please, leave me alone. You want to be a free man I traveling free, yeah. privately. I'm not hurting anybody. You know, that's the other thing that the law enforcement officers don't understand. Under the law, you have to hurt some property or hurt somebody to commit a crime. They've lost that concept. They, I mean, these guys are like babes in the woods. They don't even understand that. It's just like, oh, you broke this rule, that rule. Well, let's, okay, let's mention codes. Codes are evidence of a bankrupt society. You notice how they don't go, well, you did broke this law or that law. They, they law, they say you broke this code. Because codes take the place in a society when they're dealing in debt. And this goes all the way back to Lincoln. So practically, when you're a free man traveling about, traveling about, and you you should use an ID, some type of ID. Well, it, I just you don't have to. Yeah, you don't have to. But just you could just bring paperwork showing the law. I yeah. guess. Yeah. And like I said, like when I go around, I carry a stack of papers. So like the other day, I got pulled over. I showed him my plastic card, and the first thing he looked at it, and he kind of chuckled, and he goes, "Oh, a constitutionalist." And you know, I've learned. I don't try to argue with them. I just want to be left alone and go on my merry way. So I didn't say anything. But you don't. You actually probably get bothered more than a typical person. Well, obviously, you know, it's it's weird. You always feel a threat because when you're when I'm traveling about and and I'm just out there minding my own business and I'm not hurting anybody, I would like to be left alone. And they insist on bothering me. In other words, they will pull me over for tinted windows or whatever excuse. 
I just want to, and obviously there was no injured party. So, um, who's the injured party? The window? Yeah. So anyway, and the reason they think they can regulate your car is because you're in business. So as soon as you become a business, now you're exercising legislative privileges, and they can make all the rules and regulations over a privilege that they want. So, um, so anyway, I handed him my ID, and I handed him some papers saying, you know, why I did this, and I actually showed him this one. It's, this is the, the law that created the Department of Motor Vehicles. And, and he looked at it, and he goes, he shook his head, he goes, no, that can't be right. <laughs> now, this is a police officer. It seems to me that they should have some basic, you know, training, um, training in, in what the law is. And that shows you right there that he doesn't even know what the term operator. If you go in the code, this is no longer, they don't give you this anymore. Um, yeah, they, the, you, the statutes are the actual, if you want to call it the law, is the legislative record, but this was made in 1923. So in order to put all, all the legislative things in something that you can read, what, what happens is there's an attorney that takes the legislative things and writes it down what he thinks they are saying in a code. The code is not the law. This is the law. That's the law. This is what the legislature wrote. The code is some attorney that takes the legislature and he summarizes it for you. Basically perverts it. Yeah, so this part they've kind of left out. So what you're saying, I think I get this, is we had a lot of rights before, but slowly there's it's been gradual. a retraction of all these rights, and you guys are trying to go back. Yeah. Right, but you have to understand that we're all guilty because we they tricked us into voluntarily giving all our rights up. So if you, if you want to point the finger at anybody, we all just need to point it at ourselves. So I'm trying to wake up, get the finger out of my face, and go and start claiming my rights. I don't want any of their privileges. And that's the right thing to do is claim your rights. Claim them. Now, it, yes, it's a battle, and and uh, we got many battles ahead of us. I'm not going to tell anybody we got any silver bullets here, but you know what? If you read history. Every uh, every battle that was fought for liberty, there was there was pain involved. So you get pulled over, you don't have a license, you show them this, you still get the ticket, I'm sure. Well, normally, uh, most of the time, they would impound your car if you're not if you don't have a, a driver's license. So ninety ninety percent of the time, they are yeah. impounding your car. You yeah. don't want to drive a new Mercedes. Well, yeah. Now, I I happen to have a little up because I actually filed a lawsuit against. Um, some officers a few years back and we entered into a in my opinion a settlement agreement basically saying um, and I, I carry the, the, the judgment with me basically saying if I'm not in if you can't prove that I'm here for as a operator um, you know commercial engage, activity engaged in persons or property for higher compensation then then you need to leave me alone and if you impound my car what you think about it? If they impound your car, they're taking your property without due process. And they just violated their oath of office, which most of them don't even have a clue what an oath of office is, even though you can get it with a signature. So, by fighting for your rights, you actually have a special privilege over other people. No, I'm, I have a right. And you they, have a right. And they don't have that right. They, and and what's they, your right that you have? I can travel without. Well, I should have the right to travel without being interrupted, and allowed to have my privacy. I should be able to do what I want as long as I'm not hurting somebody else and be left alone. I want peace. Amen. But most Americans would view that as a privilege, the fact that... Well, that's the way we've been taught. Yeah. I, mean, I mean... So they can't impound your car? Oh, they well, can do it. They, they, they will do it. And it's but they only, can be held responsible, too. Yeah. The, the Ninth Circuit in, in California said if, if the Sheriff's Department breaks the law, they are liable under a civil rights action. And, and what important. does that mean? That means that, that okay, since I entered that agreement, I, and I have a court stamp document that says if you take my car uh, without proving that I was engaged in a business, um, you're going to pay me $10,000 an hour for holding onto my property. So as soon as they look at that, they go, oh, okay, well, maybe we won't do that. So instead, they will give me, make me sign a notice to appear. So that's what they did. Because if you understand 
So the, he wrote me a citation for driving without a license. So um, that's, I'm, I'm supposed to appear in a few months. Um, but if you understand what is the crime of driving without a license, it's tax evasion. The presumption is you're in a business for gain and profit and you have to pay an income tax on that gain and profit. So, so the crime is tax evasion. But I say I'm not in a taxable event. So, I'm, so I, I'm not taxable. I'm not doing anything that needs to be regulated. So that is my defense. With this lifestyle, if it really worked, you wouldn't have to pay registration fees for your car. You don't have to go yeah. get a license. You don't have to deal with the DMV. Right. Now, now why? And you shouldn't have to pay a yearly registration fee. Yeah, now, why, is that so, why am I such a, and people like us, such a threat? Because if the general audience out there, the, the people out there understood that, think of the liability the government has of refunding all that money over since 1920. Yeah. They've been doing this. They lose millions of dollars they, of revenue they, each day if everybody would wake up and tell them, hey, you know what? Or it's a cascading waterfall effect. Yes. If you let a few people through, then there's yes. no reason. And yeah. what we're saying is right now, you guys are proving the point, there is a hole in this system that they've created. Right. You have to fight, though. You have to fight for it. Yes. And it's, it's not really a hole. It's always been there. It's just whether you're willing to stand up for it. Yeah. And I'm explaining it from my point of view because okay. I'm in the system. Yeah. Well, and it looks like to me, wow, you have a special privilege. You found a loophole. That's well, how I would see it, but even though you wouldn't characterize well, it that way. And, and, and we, we've talked on the driver's license and Social Security, but this is the mes method they've used. Um, a few years ago, I took martial arts. And if you take martial arts, you understand that rather than just taking a punch, you take their punch and you use their force against them. The government has learned to take all of our energies and by using this credit system, they, they can print all the money they want and just make us liable for it. So they're taking our energy. So in other words, they can take everybody that's feeding it into the system, all their energy and, and the few of us that are trying to live like we think we should, they're taking all your guys' energy and directing it towards us. Let's, let's talk about that in the next segment here. There's millions of Americans that are fed up with the system. They can't get jobs, and they just want to opt out. They know it's all a scam. How do you, what's the steps someone starts taking? I mean, you get out of debt. That's the big thing. Right, and, and I think... Do you right away? Or walk away from your debt. Okay, either one. You know, it was all done in a fraud or counterfeit, so walk away from it. And then you're free. Yeah, but I, I think that, that your, your big, biggest freedom is knowledge. So once you understand how things work and some basic knowledge, um, you can overcome the system because you can expose their wrongdoing. Yeah. And how do people begin that process? I, you, I think for me it, it's one step at a time because we got into the system. It took us years to get in this bad of shape. And if you just jump off, it's like jumping off a cliff. Yeah. So you just do one thing at a time. And so, you know, as far as your legal rights, I would say just like fighting a traffic ticket, you'll learn so much just by fighting a traffic ticket. Um, and it, it, you won't lose anything in that thing because nothing's criminal. There's no potential jail trial with, except for driving without a license. And if you don't have a job right now, you got plenty of time to do research and appear in court and defend yourself and fight that ticket. And, and that's the beginnings of learning about your rights. Yeah, and you learn, you'll learn the basic system. A, a traffic court, I would say, is a perfect way, I mean, even if it's just a parking ticket, to learn the system and learn what your rights are and what you can do. And what resources do you use to learn? Well, almost every community has a law library, so you can go there. But So you don't get discouraged and lose hope. There is a constitutional court that's still alive in America. It's called the Court of Record. Now, that Court of Record, you have to uh, claim it. They're not just going to hand it to you. They're going to kick and scream. The judges will play ignorant of it. But a court of record is when you walk into the courtroom as a plaintiff, you are the court of record. It's not the joker with the black suit on or black dress behind the bench. That's, he's not the court of record. You are. 
as the man claiming the Constitution. And you take that Constitution, you study it, don't get off on all these wild uh, tangents about codes, rules, and regulations. That's just a debt-based system. You just stick to your Constitution, start studying it. You can, uh, you can, I think you can Google search court of record, and it'll come up under Bill Thornton's website. Yeah, I think it. I think there's twelve fifteen dot org. Twelve fifteen dot org. If you want to know the difference in the courts, if you want to know what's wrong with our legal system, that's a really good. That's. That would be a good start. That would be a good start. The Constitution's court, court of records still exists, and it's not what the new law books say it is. It's what the old law books define it as. So what I'm getting from you guys is just start living like you're free, and you're going to get into trouble, and then you <laughs> have to fight. Right. You just, have to fight from that point of view. And, yes. and, and, the, and what I guess my warning is uh, I've, I've talked to a lot of people who all of a sudden they go, oh, yeah, the everything is bad and they just they dump everything and they end up basically homeless or in jail so you need to take it step by step like I said it took us a long time to get in this much trouble and each of us know where we're at and they're the best decider of what steps they can take without getting in trouble and make it a learning process rather than a um, devastation process where you end up on the yeah. streets and the, the beauty of it all you can slowly start teaching your law enforcement officers what the law really is. And wouldn't that be wonderful if our law enforcement officers knew the law? That would be a miracle in this country. Water bill. I go, no, I got my own, my own water company. I got a well. She goes, okay, so you don't have that bill. She goes, you have a bank account? I go, no, I just got a lot of cash. I pulled out some hundred dollar bills. She goes, do you need a, do you need a wife? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we talk about all these problems of living free, but in, in the reality of it, it's living a free lifestyle is living an easier lifestyle than having to put up with all these bills, regulations, licensing. I mean, it's supposed to be a simple way to live. Yes, and in a lot of respect it is, but uh, like Tim was saying, you know, just leave us alone. So the only time we really have much of a uh, problem is when we're just going down the road minding our own business and some guy gets behind us thinks oh maybe I can write a ticket generate a little cash for my bankrupt corporation the namely some kind of a police department other than that our life is great <laughs> so what's going on here this is an off-the-grid house completely off the grid it's got a solar system in the back. It runs on a, a well water that's uh, generated with a solar power. And we can get a, go around the back here and get a look at the solar setup. And, uh, you know, living under solar power, you have to cut back on energy, but you can live comfortably. And, uh, Actually, these batteries would have cost $7,000 on the open market, but I was fortunate enough to get them for 1200 bucks because somebody working for the government said they wanted all brand new batteries, and these had a little dust on them. So I took them off their hands for 1200 So this battery bank here is supplied by these 18 solar panels above us. These 18 solar panels, each solar panel uh, produces 64 watts, and they feed that battery bank. And if you need extra power, we have a small uh, Honda generator there for backup. So sometimes you got, you know, three or four days of bad weather, you got to crank that generator up, charge that battery. But other than that, it takes care of itself. What's the utility bills for a house like this? Well, actually, they're zero, but you have to factor in, you have to buy all this hardware. So you basically have your own electric company. But you got to be a responsible person and maintain it properly, or it really gets expensive. Okay, we have a water cooler on this house because an air conditioner just draws too much energy. So we use this water cooler, and it it does fine. But if for people who think, oh, I want to get off the grid and I want to buy all this stuff, if you want to have an air conditioner running all the time, you need about a fifty thousand dollar solar system, and I don't think that's economical or necessary.
Americans need to get back to having a garden, growing a little bit of food. And if you don't know how to do it, learn how to do it. Start from scratch. It's not that complicated. And, it, and utilize a little... You know, even if you live in an apartment, you can have a garden on your windowsill. And I think that's critical for what's coming ahead for America. Yeah, I worked at a grocery chain for 21 years, and, and um, we're on this side of the mountains, and our warehouse was down the hill. So whenever we get a s snow or something where the trucks couldn't make it in, the way the system is set up now, we've got a shipment daily. So within three days, our shelves were bare. Um, and we're talking, this was, this was just a matter of snow. I mean, that's all it took. So but, if we had an oil crisis, a dollar crisis. Exactly. I mean, the way the system is now, um, the turnover rate and stuff because of their big box warehouse stores, um, they get shipments daily. And like the, the store I worked at, which was, uh, I would say, your average grocery store, probably got six to eight trucks a day. Um, and that, you know, and without, if you're not getting that shipment daily, it doesn't take long to wipe out the store. I, I'm literally within three days, it, it'll be Bear. almost shelf. So, you know, I can see where any kind of, any disruption in the system, especially in these urban areas where you're not prepared, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Time you walk in there, you cannot walk into the, to get gasoline in my local community without getting somebody hitting you up for money. Yeah, so it's not just me. In Southern California, everywhere I go, the rate of uh, panhandling is growing exponentially. It, it's yes. huge. And, and I used to give money every time I saw someone, but now that would cost me $100 yeah. per month. And, and now it's getting serious. Uh, about a month ago, my son went into a gas station, and the guy saw him take out his money to pay for his gas, and he, he pulled around outside to put air in his tire, and the guy actually pulled a knife on him. Um, luckily... Um, my son trained in martial, martial arts. arts and got him on the ground and a, and a cop flew and happened to be in the area. I, I don't know if somebody inside the store called or what, but um, that kind of thing has happened all the time. And, and, you know, the person might have been just, you know, he might have been a criminal element, but, you know, if you're out of work for a while and you're on the street, you kind of, you're compelled to, you know, survive whatever way you can. I had to say it, but anyway, yeah, everywhere we go up here, Almost any gas station you go to, a fast food place, you're going to run into people asking for money. And I read an article on that. It's not the looting and the the robberies that are that were, are going to be scary, but it's actually just the families that will hit the streets. How are you going to be able to turn people away when mass begging and what's happening starts to happen? It's going to be heart-wrenching to see people on the streets. Yeah, well, and it was kind of... Interesting. There was a guy by my the gas or a grocery store by my house. He was wearing a suit and tie, and he had a big like a computer sign. He says, "I just lost my corporate job. Can you help?" <laughs> what do you think about all this panhandling that's going on? Well, if we can, we need to you know discern which ones are sincere and help them, because these people are <laughs> they're in bad shape because of our. our with our government so you know we all need to give from our hearts when we can but like you said it can get real expensive so where, where you feel like you know what that guy's sincere try out you know if he's not that's that's gonna be on his his soul and his conscience you know what I'm really scared of 500,000 people are on um, welfare in Los Angeles County what happens when the California goes bankrupt and let's say they miss a check you know you're gonna have mass begging I mean it's already gone yeah. exponentially Exactly. So it's just going to get worse. So we've got we've got a big job ahead of us. <laughs>